Good afternoon. So um, I'm just going to run through some things in relation to the Canterbury earthquakes. Then Morris is going to make a few comments and we'll take any questions you've got about that. And then once we finish that, we'll move on to uh, all other orders of business. So earlier today, the government publicly released the third and final part of the Canterbury Earthquakes Royal Commission's report, volumes five to seven, as I said last week. This inquiry was incredibly complex, and the Royal Commission's report and its recommendations have potentially wide-ranging implications for the entire country, not just Canterbury. The full report comprises seven volumes in total, is more than 1,100 pages long, and contains 189 recommendations in total. There were 185 people who lost their lives in Christchurch uh, and in the Canterbury earthquake on the 22nd of February 2011. Of those, 175 deaths were due to failures of buildings or parts of buildings. We owed it to the victims and their loved ones left behind, as well as those people badly injured in the earthquake, to find answers as to why some buildings failed so severely. There are many tragic stories from that fateful day on the 22nd of February, where people lost their lives because they were heroically trying to rescue others, were hit by falling debris, or were simply caught in the wrong place while they were going about their daily business. The earthquake struck at the worst possible time, lunchtime on a busy workday, in late summer. We have released the last parts of the Royal Commission's report today without an official government response because we wanted the families who lost loved ones to have access to the information as soon as possible. Yesterday the Attorney General Chris Finlayson and Building and Construction Minister Morris Williamson travelled to Christchurch to meet some of the families of the victims named in the report. I'm advised it was a reasonably positive meeting but understandably Many families are still grieving and struggling to deal with their loss. With regards to the collapse of the CTV building, Volume 6 of the Royal Commission's report provides a robust analysis of the building's failure. It identifies the roles that various people played in the lead up to its failing so uh, catastrophically during the earthquake on the 22nd of, of February. Many parts of the reports are highly technical in nature and necessarily so. The former Department of Building and Housing's Technical Investigation Report, which was conducted by a panel of experts and released in February this year, was an input into the Royal Commission's report. The Royal Commission's report concludes the engineering design of the CTV building was deficient in a number of respects. It also concludes the building should never have been issued with a building permit by the Christchurch City Council because its design did not comply with the standards of the time. There were also inadequacies in the construction of the building. The Royal Commission accepts that overall, there have been significant improvement in the way buildings are consented since the construction of the CTV building. We recognise the news will be of little comfort to the families and friends of the 115 who lost their lives in the CTV building on that fateful day. Nothing will ever bring back their loved ones and not dull their pain. My thoughts are with them as we continue to try and come to terms with their loss. The Christchurch earthquake was the largest natural disaster New Zealand has ever experienced in modern times and the force of the earthquake was unprecedented. The forces from the earthquake were much bigger than even new buildings are designed to withstand. The Institute of Geological and Nuclear Science, uh, GNS, has equated them to a one in two and a half thousand year seismic event. New buildings in New Zealand are designed to withstand a 1 in 500 year seismic event. The peak ground accelerations recorded during the earthquake in some parts of the city were more than twice the force of gravity and the vertical ground accelerations were among the highest ever recorded anywhere in the world. Given the extreme severity of the 22nd February earthquake, for the most part the city's buildings generally performed well in terms of protecting life. Most buildings in Christchurch were sufficiently resilient for their occupants to get out of them alive, with the exception of the CTV building and the PGC building. However, there are now 1,400 buildings in the Christchurch CBD that have been or will need to be partially or fully demolished due to the earthquake damage. That goes to show the absolute violent and destructive nature of this event. Last week, the government also released Volume 4 of the Royal Commission's report, which uh, covers how earthquake-prone buildings are identified and managed. 
This was released alongside the Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment Consultation document with proposals to improve the earthquake prone building policy system. It is roughly estimated there are between 15,000 and 25,000 earthquake prone buildings in New Zealand under the current policy and regulatory settings. We believe it's important for New Zealanders to have their say on proposed improvements to the system as any decision will affect a large number of New Zealanders and communities across the country. This process is about ensuring we strike an acceptable balance between protecting people from serious harm and managing the economic implications of strengthening or removing the most vulnerable buildings. The Royal Commission was not responsible for determining legal rights and liabilities. These issues are more appropriately handled through other avenues, such as the New Zealand Police and the Courts. The Government needs to take the time to carefully consider the report and its recommendations. Lessons must be learned from the Christchurch experience and changes made. Many of the recommendations in Volumes 4 to 7 of the Royal Commission's report will require policy and legislative change. One thing the destructive earthquakes in Canberra have highlighted is that we need to review and improve our system for dealing with earthquake prone buildings in New Zealand. The Government feels that, after the experience of Christchurch, we need to take a more active role in ensuring buildings are up to standard. As I mentioned earlier, of the 185 fatalities that occurred in Christchurch due to the earthquake, 175 were due to failures of buildings or parts of the building. We need to learn from the experience of Christchurch, but we must also recognise and acknowledge that New Zealand is seismically active uh, and we live with the risks of earthquakes every day. We also live with the risk in, in many other aspects of our lives every day. In fact, our chances of dying in an earthquake are about one in a million, compared to one in 10,000 from dying in a road accident. It's important to recognise there is no such thing as an earthquake-proof building. Any building may fail if the earthquake is big enough. It's about mitigating that risk to an acceptable and practicable level without being cost prohibitive. There will be an adjustment phase for building owners, but it's important to remember the current system requires earthquake prone buildings to be dealt with. We are just proposing to put a mandatory national requirement and time frame around it. We expect to issue our full and comprehensive response to the Royal Commission's report uh, by early to mid-2013. Finally, I'd like to reiterate that the 185 people who lost their lives in, Christ in the Christchurch earthquake on the 22nd of February will not be forgotten. We will consider the Royal Commission's report carefully and we intend to make changes that will help save lives if and when the next big earthquake strikes. So on that note, I'll pass it to Morris um, take some questions. In, in the well, thanks, Prime Minister. I'll be quite brief because I think uh, your statement has covered most of the things we wanted to say. Uh, first of all, can I just pass my sympathy on, as I did yesterday, to all of the family and loved ones of those who did die in a number of the various buildings or the building facings falling off, and of course 115 of those were in the CTV building. Uh, as the Prime Minister said, the vast bulk of our building stock stood up very well to a cataclysmic event. Uh, at certain points in Christchurch, the vertical ground shaking was 2.2 G, which means buildings weighed 2.2 times their normal weight. It was more than four times the ground shaking that occurred in the Tohoku earthquake in Japan only a month later. But of course the CTV building, and we've done our own technical investigation through the previous Department of Building and Housing, showed that it was not built to even the code of the day. It had asymmetric shear walls, non-ductile columns, uh, a whole lot of the, uh, the strength of the concrete and so on. And in fact the findings of the Royal Commission are very much in line with the findings of the Department of Building and Housing's technical investigation. There are some variations and some differences. Uh, but they are at the margin, and frankly, it's why it collapsed uh, was more agreement on exactly how it collapsed was where there was a variation. So I thank the Royal Commissioners, all three of them are particularly spectacular individuals. They've done a fantastic report for us, uh, and there's a lot of learning to come out of these uh, reports. Number four, as you'll have already seen, we announced previously the, uh, the, the consultative document that's gone out to look at uh, the earthquake prone policy that we implement, how far do we go, how fast do we go and what part do we mandate as opposed to allowing for some freedom of choice. So I'm 
probably better off at this point to just say that's it from me, but I'm happy to answer any questions you wanted to ask. Do you expect some sort of legal challenge from the, the families now? Does this open the door for the endorsement on their part? I don't know what the families will do, but I've asked my officials to give me advice about what any possible legal avenues are we can pursue to hold people to account for what happened. Obviously putting this, these reports as we did with our technical investigation and this into the hands of the police so that they can make a determination as to what they may or may not do. We put our report and this into the hands of IPENS, the Institute of Professional Engineers, and they will be able to make a determination what they do with regards to professional registration or not, but in the end I've asked officials can you give me any advice at all about what other avenues may be explored. If you look at civil uh, proceedings, most of them would be outside of the statute of limitations because of the time frame. So who, would, who would you be looking at in that I'm not looking at anybody, I'm asking for advice about how we could pursue avenues of holding people to account and I'll wait till I get that advice. What well, you, you've got registration with regards to professional engineers, IPENs and so on. They have got the ability to make a determination as to whether any of their members hold that status or not. But that's for them to determine. So you're saying you haven't yet had any advice from your officials on whether... No, they're currently working on that right now, and I asked for that again today for a speeding up of that. Uh, because there were already those alternatives we knew, that is to put it into the hands of the police and for them to consider whether there's some action, and that's still happening and to put it into the hands of the uh, Institute of Professional Engineers for them to determine, and that's still happening. I'm quite keen to know if there's any other avenue at all that could be explored. There may not be. Well, at face value, is there any liability on the part of the Crown? Uh, no, the Crown's not a player in any of this, actually. The, the, the whole of the uh, consenting, uh, the inspections and the sign-off take place at local authority level, and the Crown, and, and if you take the leaky building syndrome, the Crown was found to have no duty of care in any of those actions. Lo it was a local authority issue. So we're talking about Christchurch City Council? Christchurch City Council did the consenting and signed off on that building. And how do people, I mean, people will feel uneasy about whether they're working in buildings okay. um, now. That well, let me cover that. Reason. The moment we did our technical investigation, we made a determination to have a look at all buildings of that genre because that are uh, unreinforced masonry or that non-ductile column or that design of un uh, asymmetric shear wall had a lot of other buildings built. So the process is now going on looking at that sort of stock across New Zealand. We had announced, if you look at your bring-ups, we were going to uh, announce our findings on the non-ductile column buildings by Christmas. The fact is it's just been so hard to get the level of engineering expertise that it'll now be early in the new year before we can finish that work and report accordingly. Do you have an idea how many buildings? Around about, Dave, the number was 300 and something, 350? 379. 379 in the end that we came to that may possibly. But look, just because they've got non-ductile concrete does not make them a risk. Just because there's a whole series of factors about a building and, and if anyone thinks, oh, well, that's got non-ductile columns, that means it's a risk. It doesn't. And so far, we're going through and just checking every one of those buildings thoroughly and signing off on them. If they are found to be of a risk, as CTB was, obviously action would be taken. Sorry, action will be taken and then the, the bill will be declared. Not you could red stick at the building and not to be occupied, if that was the case. If it was found to be that dangerous, you could actually say this is getting a non-occupy notice. We do expect to be up to well, we had announced, and therefore I'm apologising for not quite meeting the time frame, we were going to announce the results of that by Christmas. The fact that it's requiring huge amount of engineering expertise. One of the big questions that's come out of the Royal Commission about CTV was the, uh, the green stickering by people that weren't engineers after the September quake. So we've got to make sure the people who do this work are well qualified well versed and know what they're looking for and it turns out the pressure to do that just with these 370 buildings means we couldn't do it in the three month time frame. It'll be, I would imagine, March. So I'm not going to be held to an exact time because it's once they've got their work done that we'll be able to make an announcement. Do you anticipate having a, or how much tougher do you think the new regime will be given the 
failings there were with CTV. At, you know, well, well, a lot of the history of the CTV have already been uh, dealt to. We've now gone to an accreditation regime with building certification authority, so the BCAs have got to have a proper regime, they've got to have proper professionally qualified and trained people. That was done long before any of this. Uh, the licensed building practitioner regime with regards to buildings now, if you're building anything to do with the load bearing capacity of a building, you have to show that you're a qualified person. So a lot of the things in today's market, and we've lifted the code, so there's a higher standard in the building code with regards to earthquake prone already for the 2008 that we then lifted in Christchurch. I'm, I'm confident that a vast chunk of the measures we've already taken will deal with the future, although there will still be some learnings to come out of the Royal Commission and we'll look at those and announce what we, where we take things further. But the, the, the issue that I think we're focused more today is, is the past and I can't change that and I can't tell why it was that a building that didn't meet, meet the, the code got certified and got signed off and so on. Those are issues still to be determined. Sorry, how many of those 379 been red stickers now? No, I don't believe any buildings have found not to comply with the regime as it should. So this CTV is looking more and more like it was a standout separate as opposed to any of the others. But we won't know the lot until they're finished. So the 379 are throughout New Zealand? Yes, it's throughout New Zealand, right across. And they, it, you, you'll know that in New Zealand, in fact, if you go to Christchurch and see some of the buildings that came down, you'll say, I've seen one of those in Wellington and I've seen one of those in all... What happens in New Zealand over the years is a particular genre becomes the fashion and then that building gets built in a lot of places. And so we looked at a very specific genre of that type of CTV building and the structure that it had and the non-ductile columns and everything else. And then we went and determined how many of the buildings in New Zealand are like that. One of the real difficulties we faced is that local authorities' databases are very poor and they were unable to give us that information so we really are when we, now, when we announced our earthquake prone policy last week, you'll notice we said it's somewhere between 15 and 25,000 buildings. We don't know. So what's the, what's the age range for the buildings that you've identified? When were they built? Well, that these buildings were built in a 10 to 15 year time frame around that same time as the CTV building. Uh, 19, well, CTV was 86, and so I think we went from 80, 85 to 92. 85 to 92 was the time frame for those. But we've already put a press release out if you have a look at your files on that investigation. Have you it's released, just you haven't released a list though, have you? No, we haven't and we think it's unfair to the building owners to release that list until we've determined the state of those buildings. Don't you think it's unfair to the occupants of those buildings? No, no, I don't. In fact, those buildings are no less safe now than they were on the 21st of February. Our role is to make sure we identify, and at this point in time, we haven't identified another so, one. So, Morris, precisely this thing happened in Wellington with the City Council, and they, the list was leaked for quite a good reason, because people do feel that they are entitled to know if you know that a building... Uh, if, we, if we knew of a building that wasn't up to the standard, we would be announcing it that day in red stickering. We don't know of a building that's like that. This, um, this advice you've asked officials to look at, uh, will that go as widely as potential criminal um, prosecution? Well, or, or I, see, I don't know. No, I'm not a lawyer and I don't know. Okay. I've always been led to believe that criminal proceedings need to be by the police and they take that action. I'm also told that civil proceedings are outside of the statute of limitations because of the length of time ago, and it may be that uh, putting it in the hands of the police is the only avenue, but I want to be sure that we've exhausted all avenues of holding people to account. So there may be no other avenues other criminal there may, that, that may be the final advice that I get. When will you be releasing the list of buildings? The, the, the genre of that equivalent? Yes. As I said, when the engineering work is completed, we thought we could finish it by December. It's proved so hard to get engineering expertise because so many of them are involved in Christchurch on other work. Is that a valid reason for withholding that information under the official? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. It would be very, very irresponsible to release a whole list of buildings that the public might think then are unsafe when in fact they're not. And as I said... Well, it the might mean that they could then get, they could get reports on the buildings. Well, that work is going on right now, I can promise you. That work is going on right now. Your reference to the statute of limitations, is the, is the starting point for that when it was built or when the earthquake happened? Well, that's, that's another question that I would hope that the, the legal advice can tell us because I think it will to do with when the actions occurred, and that was back in 86, not to do with something that occurred by way of an earthquake lab. But Audrey, look, I'm not a lawyer and I'd be very reluctant to get into that. I've just asked for the advice. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ron. So moving on, just in terms of the ministerial activity this week, uh, tomorrow and Wednesday, obviously I'm in Wellington, Thursday I'm on the West Coast, and Friday I'm in Dunedin. Uh, in terms of the House this week, the Government will hold the third reading of the Alcohol Reform Bill, the first readings of the Resource Management Reform Bill, the Prison, Prisoners and Victims Claim Amendment Bill. Wednesday morning, the Business Committee has agreed to extend the hours to progress some non-controversial legislation on Wednesday afternoon following question time. Uh, we'll hold the adjournment debate. Prime Minister, um, a couple of weeks ago I asked you a question, this press conference, which was, um, when did the SAS director know that the GCSB was surveilling him on home? When did the SAS director know it was illegal? Did he advise your office of that? And if not, why not? So the last bit of the question is he advised my office, the answer to that is no. And answer the first two bits, I don't have an answer to that question, I don't know I'll have to ask. So, so we've obviously now had a, a very significant discovery judgment in the High Court on Friday in relation to this matter. Um, which seems to be enjoining the, well, it is enjoining the GCSB in the court action, which, as far as I know, is, is unprecedented legally around the world. This would seem to have implications for national security in terms of the cooperation between the GCSB and its intelligence partners. I don't think, I uh, can't talk about what's happened internationally. I don't think it is historic, as you'd say. The fact, actually, the Crown was already co joined because the Attorney General was. Uh, uh, was already cited, and so that effectively binds all parts of the Crown, just as part of the Crown. In terms of wider implications, well, the judge is also allowed the Stuart Greve QC to have information that might be sensitive uh, funneled through him, so get the runs. course. Prime well, Minister, just looking at, um, there was an immigration uh, court case uh, in the court this morning. Um, the immigration agent actually uses a photograph yep. of yourself on uh, their website to um, were you aware of that? Do you know this agent? Um, or is this the first you were hearing of this? No, I don't know the agent. Um, I don't know whether it's an endorsement. I've seen the photo because someone pointed it out to me 20 minutes ago. Uh, but it's it's against the rules for people to use me as an endorsement. Now, lots of people take photos with me every single day. People take photos with me. And they put them up on Facebook and they do lots of things with them. That's totally fine. But if they're using that as an endorsement, then that's against the rules. And my office will follow up on that. You'd like to see that photograph taken down off that website? If it's being used as an endorsement, yes. I mean, lots of people take photos with me and I'm quite comfortable in putting them up, but if they're used as an endorsement, it's against the cabinet manual. Now, are you concerned about the level of uh, fraud amongst uh, Chinese people who are getting Chinese visas, Chinese who are getting New Zealand visas? Is the level of fraud a concern for you? I don't have any advice on that. I wouldn't want to offer a view. Because we've had sort of cases like today, and of course there was a student visa scam earlier in the year. Is that, is that a concern? Or well, it's always a concern if somebody um, undertakes fraudulent activity against New Zealand. The case of the Chinese students, when I mean, that was followed up on, um, I think we could identify exactly where the problem was there and that's been dealt with. There are large numbers of visas that are issued to Chinese people coming to New Zealand because they're not part of the visa waiver programme and we expect to see those numbers increase because our tourism numbers are likely to increase dramatically. We see lots of young Chinese people coming to New Zealand as students. So, look, there's always risk there, um, but a lot of work's been done, I think, to strengthen the office uh, of the Immigration Service up in, in China, uh, but we'll continue to follow up if there are demonstrated cases where there are problems. So you don't think there's a particular problem with China as opposed to any other country in the world? Well, it's just that China's um, not visa waiver, and so they are much more likely to be engaged in activity simply because they're required to get visas. I can't say it's, it's specifically worse there than other countries, so I don't have any advice on that. We tend to look at the issue itself, and if there's an issue of a, you know, of, of a problem, then we follow up on that, obviously. Just looking at the tourism, there is the, um, the Chinese airline that's got the um, visa fast track deal. China has, Southern, yeah. Yeah, has bought out um, 200 odd um, travel agents today to yep. Auckland. Is that a good thing, no, obviously? Yes, yeah, a very good thing. I mean, China's now rapidly <coughs> becoming our second largest market for tourists. Um, I expect to see those numbers really explode over the next few years. Uh, there's nothing terribly unique about what's happening in China Southern. The same uh, deal is likely to apply to Air New Zealand and other airlines that come to New Zealand. They're still required to get a visa. Uh, there's a bit of a fast tracking of their financial position, and that's because of the sheer number of miles that the travel and assumption has made that they've got the, they're both likely to return to China and they've got the financial wherewithal to, to travel a lot. 
um, side I can see it as unusual and it's, it's not exactly the same, but it's quite similar to a scheme that's running in Australia and it's running quite successfully. What about, the, what about the link that's been put forward with Sky City and obviously the benefit of Sky City of these high rollers from China being able to come straight into Auckland and then straight to the casino? Well, they may, they may go to the casino, but that's true of anyone that may come to New Zealand or any New Zealander that may choose to go that's of the legal age. Uh, but Sky City will get involved, as I understand it. So why was New Zealand selected as the place of destination to, your, to the best of your knowledge? Why was New Zealand picked for the travel agents to come here? Why would well, it's a for mill. We do, I mean, airlines and tourism New Zealand, in fact, do that all the time. So they bring out travel agents to promote New Zealand. We do it with you know, Japanese travel agents. We do it with Australian travel agents. I mean, that is the fastest and most um, logical way to inform the industry about what's on offer in New Zealand because, of course, they are the face of New Zealand in those countries selling us as a holiday destination to their clients. Well, what do you think about Todd Rippon being um, sacked as a tour operator Supposedly saying something critical about the whole food, something he denies, and also for being vice president of um, Act as Look, it's an employment matter, I just don't have a view on that one more for a bit. Well, it was, it was, tourism, it was tourism officials who would blame the tourism, but they were working with Tourism New Zealand who, who made the complaint. Well, the, the issue's never been raised with me, um, so it's an employment matter, I'll just leave it there. Well, well, his employer has said department. in a conversation with him that he believed Tourism New Zealand didn't like. Involvement in that company. Yeah, so I've, I've never had any advice on that. The CTU says that your partner to blame for the backlash that Atkins Union gets. Are you? No, I can't see why that would be the case. They say that you've kind of launched a, um, a, a, you've launched a campaign that's painted them as the enemy of tourism. No, I wouldn't agree with that. You think, it's, that. you think it's his right to belong to the union of this choice? People are free to join a union if they want to. Uh, not really, no. It was, um, <sighs> surround what I was saying, no, not, not in terms of the paper. There was one, one small reference on one of the cabinet committees, but no. Not really. No. Yeah. Well, just going to China's southern airline, um, recent information shows that um, Chinese tourists tend to stay for a shorter amount of time yes. and don't spend as much money yes. here. Why are we targeting China and tourism? Well, wait, for a start off, if you look at the Chinese market, I think there were at least 70 million trips taken by Chinese individuals last year. Uh, so they, they are a very big market. They're getting wealthier. So yesterday I met with a state councillor who's here from China. Uh, she estimates that their GDP per capita, so their individual GDP, is going to double over the next five years. So that's a significant boost to their wealth. Uh, we're already seeing it a better part of, I think it's 171,000 trips, but in that sort of order of magnitude, a couple of hundred thousand. And in the foreseeable future, we'll see you know, four or five hundred thousand Chinese people coming to New Zealand. So they're a, they're a fertile market for people to come. Uh, they're interested in coming to New Zealand, and they're one, they're one stop, so one flight makes it attractive. So you know, that's a very big market, and why wouldn't we tap into that? Um, yes, they're required to get a visa, but plenty of countries are required to get a visa. It's just that 50-odd are, are not required. But they're not a fertile market at the moment, um, hugely, because they don't compared to other tourists who come here, why not wait until they get more wealthy? Well, they, they may always have different characteristics for a while. I mean, for a start off, if you look at the Japanese market, when it first came out to New Zealand, my understanding in the 70s when they first started travelling, um, they came as bus tours and they were pretty cheap and cheerful trips. Um, and then we started seeing them coming and spending a lot more money and staying longer. The, the Chinese tourists we've been attracting um, historically have been tending to come on these organised bus tours rather than sort of what we would call as free and independent travellers. We expect to be able to grow that market where you'll see people coming for longer, spending more, and taking different sorts of tourist activities here. So we've been marketing that very, very heavily. One of the reasons for having these Chinese tourists, uh, Chinese um, travel agents coming to New Zealand, although it's arranged by China Southern, I think, but Tourism New Zealand will meet with them, is to try and um, make sure that we show them everything that's on offer. We also have Chinese um, tourism ambassadors, so Ya Chen, uh, the woman that was here for um, the, the Hobbit premier, for instance, she got married in New Zealand. I mean, the, she got married in Queenstown. The amount of social media coverage she got was phenomenal. I mean, and incredibly large. So there's a really um, keen market, hungry to learn about New Zealand and want to come here. Tourism hires a huge number of New Zealanders directly and indirectly, and that's a great way of promoting jobs. Do you think Sky City will be part of the 
But around about a third of all government expenditure in some form goes in the areas of health and welfare. And that is targeting, not in totality of course, but firmly on vulnerable children. I was talking yeah, just on the, um, sort of on the CTV or the Earthquake Commission, it must be a particularly tricky or challenging day for the families of those victims yep. to, to, to read that this shouldn't have even got consent, shouldn't have been given permission. Well, look, it's gut-wrenching for them. I mean, they're in a position where they're now reading a report uh, that says at so many levels uh, there was failure and they were let down and that is uh, the reason that their loved one is no longer with them. So it's a very sad day for them. Uh, you know, there are a number of places you can potentially point fingers, but I mean, the aim of the Royal Commission wasn't to apportion the liability, it was to lay out the facts. I mean, in the end, there are now other authorities like the police and the courts who will have to make a decision whether they want to take criminal prosecutions. I, I, I'm reluctant to wait and say too much more because I don't want to get in the way of that process, but um, the police will do what they feel is appropriate. Have you given any consideration to Hone's Food and Schools Bill? Oh, I haven't read the bill, I'm sorry. But in terms of the general concept? Well, we've done a bit on food and schools since we've been the government. So we, for instance, extended fruit and schools, we put more money into kids can funding. Um, I think there's a, it's, there's a legitimate issue around um, some children, and so we've attempted to try and broaden it out without building dependency. Um, I'm not ruling out doing a bit more in the future, um, but I, I don't think it's it's totally universal. I don't think you can go to every DSL 1, 2 and 3 school and say every child is going hungry and a food and schools program is appropriate for every school, because I've visited quite a lot of schools. And the feedback I get is that uh, if there's 250 children in the school, a portion of them will go to their breakfast program or require lunch, but certainly not all and lots of parents. Um, even in very poor financial circumstances, will make sure that their child is properly fed. So I don't think we need a universal approach, but we'll just take a closer look and see whether we've got the target and the right. This morning you uh, told TV that you may consider a new walker jump back legislation. Have you had any talks with other parties about that? Or? I haven't. I mean, I think as I pointed out this morning, I mean, the, the, it's one of those situations where it's easy to identify the problem and quite difficult to identify the solution. Um, if we could write rules which were coherent and sort of sustainable, I suspect there'd be quite widespread consensus across Parliament. I mean, in principle, if somebody um, is you know, thrown out of their party for very good reason and they're a list MP, then I actually think they do lose the confidence of the House because they came here under the guise of that parliamentary support. I think that political party should retain uh, that level of proportional representation. So it worries me when you see an MP leaving that all of a sudden it changes the proportional representation of Parliament that the voters of New Zealand thought carefully about before they voted. The only point I'd make though is that it, it, we just can't have a situation where I as the leader of the National Party say XYZ list MPs face doesn't fit anymore because they're giving me hard time so therefore I'll just expel them from the party and they're expected to leave Parliament. That's the challenge. And have you had a chance now to consider the prospect of Mr Horan's proxy? Well, I think well, in the first instance, I haven't even talked to the, either the lips of the leader of the House about that, but I think in the first instance we would want to understand exactly what he's accused of. I mean, using his mobile phone, I saw some reports say he might have used it 144 times during the TAB over 10 months. Well, to the best of my knowledge, and I might stand corrected, is not the reason to sack a member of parliament. I mean, I use my mobile phone to ring my wife. I, ring my, I use my mobile phone to make restaurant bookings. They are of a personal nature. My understanding is that's exactly why you're allowed to do that under the rules. There's a fringe benefit element. Ringing 14 times a month, is that an addiction? I reckon that'd be a stretch. Well, we were very keen to know why Richard Worth was made to resign and he didn't oblige us, so why should New Zealand first put him? They don't have to, but I'm just, he's asking the question about whether I'm going to take their proxy, unless I understand it fully, um, I won't. Have you been approached about the proxy? I don't think so. Prime Minister, in relation to the use of cell phones, Telecom's announced roaming cha changes today, um, <coughs> which allow you to roam. Do you personally use... 
Do I use roaming? Yeah, I think so when I go overseas, but it depends on where I go. At a cost of like ten dollars a megabyte. I mean, it's prohibitively expensive to use roaming data. I mean, you don't you don't have a second cell phone or use a SIM or, or, or do other things. And when you go to Hawaii, do you have a US cell phone number? Or? Depends on where I go and what I do. Can I just be clear about the um, Kyoto advice? Uh, were you not were you not aware of the risks in Zealand could be exposing itself to by not signing up to the other Well. I'm comfortable with the position that we've adopted. No, but the question was, were you aware of the risks? Well, there may be something in that documentation that spells out there are some implications. I can't remember that exact phrase. I have to go and have a look at that. But whatever the way that's couched, I'm still totally comfortable that there's the right decision and the markets will continue to operate. In fact, the argument's been the other way. The argument's been that we're allowing too many units of foreign nature into New Zealand. That's been the argument the foresters have put up, that we're effectively undermining the market by allowing a flood of foreign credits, not that there are too few foreign credits coming in. It's the other way around. There's also indications for removal units, though, for the forestry. Well, we have the capacity always to print units, to issue units. We, I mean, essentially, that's the point of being in the convention track, isn't it? You're the master of your own destiny. And, we all, and the legislation gives us the capacity to auction units. Well, the DTS will never be able to link with Australia, then, will it? Well, I wouldn't want to jump to that conclusion yet. I mean, we're in a per period of time where the vast bulk of countries are not party to CP2. I mean, no one's arguing that the United States isn't doing its part, no one's arguing that Canada's not doing its part, or many, many other countries. I mean, New Zealand takes its responsibility seriously, but I don't think signing up to CP2 is the test of whether you're, you're discharging your responsibilities under climate change appropriately. But if you're going to make a binding commitment, what's the difference if it's politically or... <coughs> if, you say, if you say politically binding, um, it's different to a legally binding one, why not stick with the legally binding one? Well, because the legally binding one would be under the old rules of Kyoto, of which we ourselves have reached a preliminary agreement changes, for instance, around land use, but those rules have not been ratified yet in CP2. So why would New Zealand, with a unique set of, of emissions profile, under a land use change rule that doesn't suit New Zealand, agree to those rules? You said you would abide by Kyoto's rules. Yeah, we'll stay in the framework. Yeah, we will stay in the framework, but within that framework there's lots of capacity to have um, flexibility. That's one thing we've been advised of. Prime Minister Kim Dot Com's appearing in, in a show in Auckland with a bunch of celebrities called Mega Christmas. Are you planning on going to the show? Uh, on that note, can I take this opportunity to wish you a very Merry Christmas because this is the last uh, post cabinet press I'll know that I'll see you on Wednesday night. But all the very best and nice Christmas. We'll see you in the new year.